Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Uh, happy Wednesday, uh, happy hump day, and happy part two. This is gonna be part two of the conversation we were having yesterday where it was basically me going on and we interviewed uh, Pastor E.W. Uh, Jackson. Uh, Troy McSwain was here in studio uh, with us yesterday. Somehow we've allowed Troy back into the building, uh, but I wanted to invite in other people to the discussion that we were having yesterday where we were unpacking the fallen culture that we have here in America and I put together a series of videos and explanations and conversations to say this fallen culture is most acute in what we call or what the puppet masters call black culture, the culture that has been assigned to black people. And then we brought in E.W. Jackson to explain what our reaction should be to America's fallen culture and it helped me to understand why I'm gonna have to get involved with politics, even though I've tried to abstain and stay out of it, and I have, and I haven't tried, I have abstained and stayed out of it all of my life, because we are right now in a time of spiritual warfare and spiritual conflict. And so we heard mostly from me, mostly from E.W. Jackson, uh, but I wanted to bring in some of our contributors. Uh, and so we're gonna bring in Virgil Walker, you guys have, uh, heard from Virgil before, uh, I believe on the show last week or two weeks ago. Very good friend of Delano's. He's kind of cut from the same cloth as Delano, and so we'll get his perspective on our conversation yesterday. T.J. Moe uh, will be here, uh, and we'll get his perspective. And of course, it's Wednesday. That means Bobby and Anthony will be here, and we'll get their perspective about what we should do as Christians in this fallen culture will get their reaction to E.W. Jackson's, Bishop E.W. Jackson's comments that he gave at the Karis Bible College with uh, Reverend Andrew Womack that we talked about uh, in detail yesterday. <clears throat> but this is just a continuation of yesterday's conversation where I'm gonna invite in some of our uh, contributors, regular people I respect and get their take on what they heard yesterday from me, what they heard from E.W. Jackson. And so first up, uh, we'll, go, we'll roll out to uh, Virgil Walker. Virgil, <clears throat> welcome back to the show. Virgil uh, is the host of his own podcast, a friend of the show, a friend and supporter of the show. Virgil, I know you uh, watched uh, yesterday's show. Uh, you sent me a note about it. You sent me a note about a lot of the show, <laughs> show but you sent me one, one about yesterday. And, and, and so I, I wanted, what are your thoughts about my epiphany, revelation, and, and belief that like, okay, E.W. Jackson finally explained to me in a compelling way why I have to involve myself in politics. Yeah. And I, I just... What, what were your thoughts on my reaction and some of the things he was talking about? Yeah, well, Jason, again, thanks for having me back. It's an honor to be with you. I would just tell you that uh, for me, it was a joy to watch you respond to what was being said. Um, I, I think your show is, has, has it, you know, over the course of the time that, that I've been connected and watching, uh, it really, all of what uh, E.W. Jackson talked about really, really kind of culminated uh, in what you've been doing, what you've been wanting to do, the direction you've been going, culminated in, in, in one conversation. Uh, I would say that, that at the same time, uh, while it was great to watch you respond and react to it, while at the same time, none of what he was saying was, was something new or revelatory. I, I don't mean any disrespect in any way, shape or form. I simply mean it in this way, Jason. I think we're living in a time when, when saying the truth, when, when telling the truth has become countercultural, right? We're living in a time when, when, when to say that, that, that a man isn't a woman and a woman isn't a man is countercultural. So to hear a man like, like Jackson get up and share what he did, uh, uh, it, it, it really cr 
crosses kind of the, 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 the you know, make, makes a loud sound. You're like, whoa, you're, you're struck by it. You're all struck by it. And it causes you to, to pause and, and sit back and go, what did I just witness? Um, the reason why the response is that way is because we've been listening to so much garbage for so long uh, that once you hear the, the, the clarity of truth being shared, it, it jars you. Um, what, you know, he was he was sharing everything like, you know, hard work is good, you know, that it's not it's not a bad thing for us to to, to work hard, uh, that, that, you know, that, that we need to work. Uh, he addressed the issues around CRT um, with crystal clarity, unlike many other pastors and preachers uh, that, that, that I know. I, I feel fortunate in that the circles that I run in, we're talking about this stuff all the time and we're sharing it. But but the culture has swallowed down this victim and you know victimized ideology uh, that, that tells us that we're the oppressed uh, and as a result we need to collect a check. Um, he, he, he debunked that. All of those things are things, again, Jason, that you've been talking about for quite some time. Uh, and again, I think it all rang true for you in this one, uh, you know, this one sermon. Uh, and so it was great for me to watch, uh, watch it unfold on you and then for you to share it with, with the audience. For me, I, I just kind of wanted, I, I wanted to, to tell you while I was watching, I was like, welcome home, brother. Just welcome home. We, we've been here waiting on you for a while. Uh, we're, we're, glad, we're glad you're coming our way and, and, and it's all good. I, I want to say this before I, I, I turn it back over to you. This is not about, about, about lifting up conservatism. Uh, this is not about lifting up the Republican Party. Uh, this has everything to do with lifting up the cross of Christ. Uh, this has everything to do with, with what you what you talk about, which is a biblical worldview, having that and then functioning in such a way in society where it really matters. What the culture would like for us to do, Jason, is to show up at our church, uh, listen to, to sermons and prayers and, and be quiet and say nothing and go in the corner. And I think what you're advocating, whether it's the issue of politics or what you're doing with your platform, it's we're not gonna be quiet anymore. We're gonna go out and make a difference and we're gonna do it in the name of the Lord, based upon a biblical worldview. You know, some of the reaction uh, I saw yesterday to our conversation mimicked some things I heard from Troy and conversations, Troy, you, you were saying you've had with your friends. Everybody immediately goes to, if you stick to a biblical worldview and, and you stand on that, that somehow what you're doing is you're defending the Republican Party and how come you're hypocritical of the Democratic Party. And one of the things I appreciated, Troy, I gotta be honest with you, even though I was frustrated at the time, but I appreciate it. You forced me to clarify my position. Yeah. And, and, and I, I appreciate that because I, I, I've tried to stay out of politics. But, but I can't, and it's because, and the reason why I'm so critical of one group is because like, hey, a debate about how much people should be taxed, I, I'm, I can go either direction on that. I, I, I'm an idiot who actually believes like, hey, one of the most patriotic things I do is pay taxes. And I'm sure that's an idiot belief. I'm sure someone will explain that to me that you know, actually the government shouldn't be taking your money, but again, I actually, I don't feel bad. I'm, I've been a high earner, I don't mind paying taxes. Uh, and so when they debate about whether or not there should be taxes, it doesn't bother me. Either side could be right. If they're debating about health care, I, I could care less. But when one side starts saying and pushing for drag queens to come to little schools and to et teach our kids how to read. When one side is like taking kids to drag queen shows, when one side is promoting teachers who wanna have conversations with kindergartners, first, second, and third graders about their sexuality and gender. When one side is saying anybody can be a woman, it's just a vibe, it's, it's a feeling. And you know what, if William Thomas wants to become Leah Thomas and go compete against women in swimming, we're, we're for, well, 
actually I care about, that's a line in the sand for me, where I can't just be like, well, I can see the other side of that. I can't see the other side of some of these issues because they contradict my biblical values and just things that I firmly believe shouldn't happen. And so that's why you're hearing me loudly criticize Democrats and the left if they were just arguing about health care and taxes and uh, whether roads should be paved uh, or any of that, I'd leave it alone. Right. But, but they're arguing about things that is like, well, I'm just not on board with. And I have no problem with the LGBT people. But I, I believe because of my religious convictions and just my overall belief uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right, right. And I'm not coming off of that. And one side is pushing, no, it's between whoever you want to marry. And the next thing I know, and one side seems to be clearly going down the slippery slope of, they're going to legalize pedophilia. Yeah. And I'm just against that. And so that's why I'm critical of them because of the changes I keep seeing them have in the culture and codifying an immorality that I'm not going to get on board with. And so I, I try, I, you know, I'm, I tease that, you know, you just showed up and you're here out of town and you demand to be on the show, but I'm actually glad you're here, Troy. Yeah. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you cleared some things up too because I took that little segment of me and you and you explaining yourself yeah. and I pulled it off and I sent it to everybody so I could defend, yeah. so I could show them, hey, he's not that bad. He's really, this is what he's really about. <laughs> you know, because a lot of people have fault, they, they don't understand you. They just don't understand, it's just, they don't know you to understand you. And yeah. you've, you, yesterday you enlightened me on how, to do, how I can properly defend my stand yeah. with you and be your yeah. friend. So yesterday was a good show for me because I actually have some ammunition to send back to him and say, here, take that. Uh, yeah. Virgil, should I consider it high praise that I'm just not that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you should. I think you should, given, given the fact that if we, if we would compare that to what they did with Christ, right? Christ was the most loving, most kind, most gentle. And what happened? They crucified him. Uh, so, so if, the, if by comparison, uh, you've got your folks who, who may feel like they're on the wrong side of, of, of where you uh, are standing, who feel like, you know, you're, you're not that bad. I think, I think, you're, I think you're doing pretty good. Uh, script, scripture's also clear about what you're talking about, Jason. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. There, there are people who suppress the truth of God that they know in unrighteousness. That's what you're against. When you talk about the, the things that you don't, don't want, that you're not going for, you're not standing for, Scripture says that God's wrath abides on those things. And so you're pushing back against those things. And, and because of the fact that you care and love your neighbor, your brother, those who look like you, you're trying to give them the information they need to come along with you. And so the hope would be uh, that they wouldn't villainize you, but that they would see what you're sharing with them as, as good news, uh, that they need to come, that they need to understand faith, they need to understand the gospel, they need to understand who Christ is uh, and repent of their sin follow him and, and quit worrying about whether it's, it's an R or a D or anything like that. You follow Christ, that's all that matters at the end of the day. Virgil, do you think any of this message is sinking in uh, to the masses of black people that have an addiction to the Democratic Party? And, and, and what, what I have said to people, and, I don't, and I've said this for several years, uh, b because black people have been convinced through mass media that every white Republican or wh every white conservative or every white evangelical uh, is racist and hates black people. And, and, and I find that laughable and stupid, but what I have ended up saying to people eventually is like, okay, l let's say that's true. I go, as a Christian, I I'm just sorry. I'm not running around 
worried about what people think of me. Yeah. I'm actually concerned. What do they think of God? What do they think of the values expressed in the Bible? And, and again, if they have the sin of racism within them, I'm going to let God deal with that. So if they don't like me, I'm going to let God handle that. I'm going to keep it moving and, and do control what I can control. But I actually uh, want to judge people based off their values, w what they defend, and, and, and I do, whether they're a believer or not. Again, it's not, I'm not judging non-believers harshly, right. Right. but I don't put them in the same category <laughs> as believers because I, I really just, and my overall point, what I say to people, I really don't care what you think about me I care what you think about God, because if you're filled with some sort of sin, but you love God, eventually he's yeah. going to fix that. No yes. different that I'm looking in real time at him fix my sin of gluttony. I'm watching this over the past year like, wow, this, God's amazing. Once I started leaning into my faith, my behavior changed around eating, and I, I'm if. If, if there is some white person who's a believer, who has a problem with black people, if they keep believing, God's gonna take that sin away from them and, right. and fix that. Right. But Eddie, your response. No, you, 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 you loaded a lot in that, that section there. I, I, would, I would start by simply saying, you know, regarding those folks who uh, are always seeing a, a racist behind every tree, like every time they turn around, they, they wake up in the morning trying to figure out how someone else is 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 is, is great, you know, is a racist. Uh, they wake up every morning with some issue, something that they believe is is happening that's that's keeping them down. Those those folks who engage in that level of ideology are really truly the true white supremacists. The the for for you to believe that 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 white people are 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 waking up every day thinking about you. Uh, a, something's wrong with you. Uh, and B, th that's the most narcissistic idea ever. And, and, and then C, finally, who cares? Uh, no one is going to, look, if you truly believe in an all powerful, all knowing, all loving God, whom you've bowed the knee to, repented of your sin toward and, and are following him, he's well able to navigate your life in such a way that you're not going to be overcome by some white white racist. Um, we, we, the, the God, the God that, that, that those folks worship is way too small. Uh, the God that the God of the Bible, the God of, 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 of E.W. Jackson, that's a big God. Uh, and he's well able to, to manage those things. The, the, the question you initially started with, Jason, was, you know, uh, are, 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 are folks going to get it? Are, are folks going to going to wake up and see it? Uh, I, 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 I believe that many do. I believe that many are. I believe that what you're doing in this platform is encouraging a, a, a lot of folks. Uh, I think it's pointing people in the right direction. But at the end of the day, we're not accountable and responsible for the results. Jason, you and I are accountable and responsible to ensure that the true message gets preached and we let God handle the results. That's how that is supposed to work. Virgil, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll hear from you again uh, next week. Uh, great job. All right, uh, Ronald Reagan once said, all great change in America starts at the dinner table. Well, there's no company doing more to help you bring your family and friends to the table than Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers delivers 100% American meat to your door. They guarantee your meat is born, raised, and harvested here in the United States so you know who you're supporting. I have personally tried it, and this is truly a great product. The T-bones, burgers, ribeyes, and even the chicken, it's all some of the best I've had. I mean, they age every cut to perfection so that you can enjoy a true steakhouse experience every single time. Every box is of superior quality, flavor, and value. Good Ranchers support American agriculture and business. They support us and what we do, so go check them out. Support those who support us. Your country and taste buds will thank you. Make sure to use my promo code FEARLESS to get $30 off your order, plus get free express shipping. You can make gatherings at the table common again with Good Ranchers. Take advantage of this offer before it's gone. Go to goodranchers.com fearless to start bringing people to the table. 
creating change in America and eating seriously delicious food from good ranchers. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, T.J. Moe from St. Louis, but uh, we're in studio. Uh, Pastor Anthony Walker, Pastor Bobby Harrington, you guys know who these guys are. It's Tennessee Harmony. It's Wednesday. Uh, gentlemen, if you could uh, bless our conversation, I'll get us rolling. God, uh, we just come to you uh, and we just ask that you would take over today and help us to talk about the things that really matter and that matter to uh, that we would see from your perspective, God. Father God, as always, we're thankful for the opportunity to share your word, to uh, be an example, be a light into the world. Help us, Father, uh, as was stated, to exemplify your will and your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so we're just continuing the conversation about E.W. Washington, from, from yesterday, and I wanted to get more of a biblical perspective or two ministers' reaction to Bishop Jackson's sermon that so moved me. T.J. Moe is who sent me the sermon because I believe they played this sermon at T.J.'s church in St. Louis. Uh, Bishop Jackson is from Virginia. I believe he may have been in Texas. I'm not sure where Karis Bible College is where Andrew Womack is, is located, but he gave the sermon there two weeks ago. They replayed it at TJ's church. TJ then sends it to me. It has this incredible impact on me in terms of, I've always tried to, my best to stay out of politics and not be a participant, but EW did a great job, I think, of explaining that uh, the spiritual battle that we're in is gonna have to cause us to take that fight into politics and in, into every aspect and avenue of American life, global life, whatever. But I wanna play uh, two of the most, I thought, important sound bites that we played from yesterday. I wanna replay them, and then we'll bring Bobby and Anthony and TJ into the conversation. The first one, uh, EJ, EW is, is quotes Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address and then talks about how this is a spiritual battle that Christians are gonna to have to get involved in. Is that we are in a profound spiritual battle for the heart and soul of this nation. Now, of course, this plays out in the political world and it plays out in the cultural world, plays out in the institutions of our country, but it is ultimately a spiritual battle, not a political one and not a cultural one, ultimately. And by the way, for those who say, yeah, but you know, I get this criticism, but Bishop Jackson, you, you are so involved in politics and preachers ought to stay out of politics. I tell them, I, I don't think of it as politics. I think of it as prophetic ministry. I think of it as the same ministry that Moses was engaged in when God called him and anointed him and sent him down to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. The same ministry that Elijah was engaged in when God called him and anointed him to tell Ahab and Jezebel that they were troubling the land of Israel and that God was going to judge them for it. The same ministry that Nathan was engaged in when he confronted David over his lies and, and murder and told the story about the the little ewe lamb that the poor man had, that the rich man took away. And when David heard this story, it touched his heart so much, he said, where is that man? That man should die. And Nathan pointed at him and said, you are the man. That wasn't politics. It was prophetic ministry. And it's the same thing that John the Baptist was engaged in when he told Herod, you are sinning against God because you have unlawfully taken your brother's wife. And many people said, John the Baptist, preach the gospel, stay out of politics, would you? But he said, God has called me to bring light to every situation. And it's about time the church realized that you can't 
hide light behind a, a, a wall or hide it under a basket. You've got to take it into every endeavor in life and you can call it what you will, but the church must speak the truth to these political leaders around this country because if we don't tell them, who's going to? And so yeah, I want to stop there before I get to the, the next one and just hear from, you know what, I want to bring TJ first before we hear from the experts, the guys <laughs> on the front lines and the trenches. Let's hear from one of the corporals sitting behind the desk comfortably. TJ, uh, what did you think of that? Obviously, I know you loved it because you sent it to me and thought it was one of the best sermons you ever heard, but what did you think of his explanation of why we got to take the battle into every avenue? This is what I've been arguing since I joined the show, and that is that pastors in, throughout history have always been a part of what a lot of people would consider to be politics, right? And he gave plenty of examples of that throughout the Bible. This is true in American culture, too. David Barden is my favorite historian. He's a diehard Christian, works closely with Glenn Beck and a lot of other guys. One thing he talks a lot about is the Revolutionary War and how we probably lose that war if it's not for ministers, because they were the ones who were leading the charge. If you, you talk about the, the very first, the beginning of the war, Revolutionary War, British come to Massachusetts, they're trying to seize and destroy all the ammunition and such. John Hancock and, and John Adams were both under death threat from the British at the time. It was Reverend Jonas Clark who housed them both, said, you come stay with me. I'll take whatever risk that is. You come in my doors and we'll, and we'll handle this. And when the British came, he showed up with his 70 congregants and they went out and fought the first battle at Lexington. Same thing happened at Concord with William Emerson. That was a reverend who was out there and took his 300 congregants from his church and fought, actually fought back the British at that time. You know, there's a book called... Um, Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution, published way back in 1861. It talks about how Reverend Philip Payson, he, he hated bloodshed and war, and he preached patience and even submission There's in this book. And when he saw what happened in Lexington and Concord, he went and got his people, they lined the streets as the British were headed back to Boston and retreat after Concord. He was lining the streets with members of his congregation, and it was the church fighting the battle for freedom. That's pretty political, you'd say, in a lot of ways, when you're trying to fight for your freedom in a revolution. And it was the ministers leading the charge in this way. And so I just think pastors, over the years, again, the separation of church and state, some of the decisions that the government has put us in, I think it was the 1947 decision at the Supreme Court, has really pushed uh, preachers and ministers out of the public square. And we really, really need to reinsert ourselves back into it. Mm. All right, that's TJ's take, which coincides with mine, but we're not on the front lines. Uh, we sit comfortably behind desks or at home. Uh, you guys are. Your thoughts on E.W. Jackson and TJ's interpretation? You go first. Um, you know, when he listed the reasons about politics, all of those examples he gave, Elijah, <clears throat> Jezebel, uh, Nathan coming to David, these were godly men approaching a politician, but they themselves were not politicians. They weren't running for office. They weren't trying to align themselves with a political sway. They're just coming on behalf of God. So what I try to do in the same vein, uh, I'm not trying to align myself with any kind of party because then I've got to give onus to that party when things go down. I need to stand at a place from a godly perspective, no matter who is there, because if that person gets up there, I need to be able to say, hey, we agree on this policy, but this is what God says. I'm not coming at it from a political angle. That's where I stand from the, and I don't want to you know, be semantic, but the political side of it, I, we have to be careful of as ministers because we don't want to stand with a party per se. We just want to stand with God. Whatever God says is where we stand. Yeah. Uh, what I loved about the sermon was the way that he spoke the truth about current cultural issues from a biblical point of view, giving guidance and direction about what God says about these current issues. And that's, that's the realm of the kingdom of Jesus and of preachers. Once we start aligning ourselves with a political party, 
either to the right or to the left. We marry that party, and in history, it always turns out badly for the church because uh, you have a lot of Christians, for example, who totally embrace Donald Trump. And Donald Trump's an ungodly person who did ungodly things. And it's not good to associate Jesus with Donald Trump any more than it's good to associate Jesus with Joe Biden. Now, that doesn't mean that the policies that they're advocating for are equal because they're not. In a lot of ways, the policies that Joe Biden is advocating right now are contrary to the ways of Jesus. And if the point is we need to speak out about moral issues according to what the Bible says and about cultural issues according to what the Bible says, then sign us up for that. But once you want us to marry a political party, we're both going to say, no, we are not going to align Jesus with a political party. I, I think that e in defense of E.W. Jackson, and I don't think you were talking about T.J., but I think T.J. is in the same boat. I don't think E.W. Jackson is talking about aligning with a political yeah, party. Yeah, I actually thought he did a pretty good job with that. And, and I, I, for me, and again, why I had this epiphany that as someone who has stayed out of politics, you know, I've been so confronted with issues that uh, are, that I'm convicted about, have strong convictions and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so what has made me say, well, I got to get involved is like, again, I talked about this earlier in the show, it's like when you start talking about uh, I can't define what a woman is. When you start talking about, hey, I want to bring drag queens into school, have them teach kids, have them talk about sexuality and gender with first, second, and third graders. That is what, because they can have all kinds of debates about taxes, where the roads should be paved, whether the trash is going to get picked up. Politi I could care less. And both sides probably got truth on their side to that argument. But when you start talking about same-sex marriage, I'm locked in because of what the Bible tells me. And, and, and that's what I heard from E.W. Jackson, is like there are some cultural issues going on that as Christians we're locked in on. We, we don't, and that, again, I don't understand how a, a pro-choice pastor, I, I just don't, it's taken out of my hands. The Bible speaks clearly on this. So it doesn't matter what I may think or what some teacher may have told me. I, and so I see these issues at the forefront and that's what's like, I gotta get off the sidelines, I gotta get involved. It's not about a political party, it's about a handful of issues that make me say, we're leaving a horrible, we're leaving hell on earth for our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, TJ, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think you heard it the same way. And, and I'm going to play a clip here from EW where he elaborates on that. But go ahead, TJ. Well, I, I just want to reinforce what you're saying. And I think I think he was clear. He said, I didn't I didn't find the Republican Party. They found me based on my biblical beliefs. He stated that very clearly. So he was not trying to align with them. He said they happened to be aligning with me and my biblical outlook on life. So let's play. The, and this is the moment where it like really this is towards the end of his sermon, really hammered the point to me. Because, again, as I've talked about with Troy this week on the show, uh, today and yesterday, in terms of when you stick to a biblical worldview and, and people, they frame it as conservative. I, I don't even like that word conservative. I just think I have a biblical worldview. I certainly don't like, I certainly don't want to be labeled a Republican. There's no evidence that I am. I've never voted. I, I don't like political people. But, but they framed everything as, you know, a biblical worldview. Therefore, you must love Trump and the, the political, you know, the conservative and Republican Party. And it's just not true. And I thought he hammered the point here beautifully. I know Donald Trump is not my savior. Amen. Donald Trump is not the Messiah. He is a flawed man, just like all others. And he has done some wonderful things in this country and for this country. And I honor that. I respect that. I'm, I'm glad for that. But I'll tell you something. I don't put my hope in Donald Trump. 
and I don't put my hope in Anthony Fauci, and I don't certainly don't put my hope in Joe Biden. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand, because he's the only one who can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. He's the only one with a name that is above every name. And I've got news for you. His name is bigger than the Democrat Party. His name is bigger than the Republican Party. His name is bigger than politics. His name is bigger than anything that comes against us. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Do I have a witness here? Every eye will behold him. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. 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 So look, the truth sets us free. That's fantastic. It summarizes. <laughs> Isn't that just fantastic? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it hits me every time. Yeah. It, it makes That's me right. emotional every time because I, I get, I've been having this debate and discussion for years and been raising some objections for years and just, and again, I keep trying to tell people like, dude, this isn't a Republican or Democrat thing. This is like, I actually, the things that I say I believe in, I actually believe in and, and they're rooted in my faith and to hear, I just, I need to hear more, pre, I guess what TJ saying, the other thing that I found here with E.W. Washington or E.W. Jackson, his, the whole sermon was so masculine. And I, I think too much of the church has been feminized. Yeah. We cater mm -hmm. to uh, the female congregation and not want to do anything to irritate them and uh, it's, it's ineffective. It, it's, mm -hmm. That type of sermon is attractive and will raise up men. Yeah. Men aren't in the church because I don't, they don't hear that. Yeah, I think that you're totally correct about that. Do you know that 65%, I'm sorry, 62% of people who attend church in North America are women. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't have a problem reaching women. You have all these people saying we've got to care more about misogyny and all that. No, the, the problem is you're, you're pushing men out of the church because the church is not masculine enough. We don't call people to the challenge that God wired men to hear and to show them how Jesus is the perfect uh, model and example and person to follow for men. I totally agree with you. Men need to be reached. Um, it, is, it is one of the focal points of my ministry. Um, we were talking about it on the way here to the show. You know, one of the first things that I did when I got to uh, Highway 231, I knew I had to galvanize the men because my ministry would not be effective without them. Uh, men represent households. They represent husbands and fathers and families. And if we can get the men on board with God, the family is going to follow. So. Yes, and we need to hear what he was, you know, really underlining there. We need to hear that Jesus is the name above every other name. He's a name above LeBron. He's a name above Michael Jordan. He's a name above Donald Trump, Joe Biden. Jesus is our Lord and master. And if we follow him, everything else is going to fall into place. Everything else is going to line up right. And so even as ministers, you know, we've got to underline Jesus and we definitely have to embolden and empower God's men. Anthony, I know you just had a men's summit. Yes. What, what did y'all address? What was the theme? What the was theme this year was battle cry. Um, and usually when you think of that phrase battle cry, you think of what you're crying going into battle. Uh, but we dealt with the flip side of that, which is you're in the middle of battle crying out. So a lot of godly men, uh, we're in the midst of battle that cried out to God. Uh, one of the highlights of the lesson uh, was David. 
he's under attack by the Amalekites. They had just taken all the women and kids. So when he gets back to Ziklag, uh, all the women and kids are gone and the men just cried out unto God. But then the, the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. So it's in that cry that he's crying out to God. God reassures him, says, go and you will not fail. And when he went back, he recovered all, all the women and kids. So the same thing we were telling the men is that when we connect with God, those men who are in marriages that are difficult, those men who, whose families are broken up, whose kids are you know, all across, those who are just overwhelmed with life, when you cry out to God, you got to get in the word. And when you get in the word and get emboldened by God, he will help you to recover everything and get your life back right. Uh, it was a it was a great conference. Uh, men be behind every session we did, we prayed together, we laughed together, we cried together. But it was a good space for men. We even had young men, uh, 12 up to about 80 and not a whole lot of in between. Uh, so we crossed bridges between age barriers. We had older, wiser men talking to younger men about marriage. We had young men talking to younger men about overcoming sexual temptation. It was it was great, man. We had a great time. Bobby, I want to ask you this uh, and, and Anthony and or TJ follow in. Uh, I, I sit here and part of where my mind goes is uh, one of my nephews went to a Catholic high school, all boys Catholic high school. It was a great experience for him. He loved being in a Christian environment that uh, was all male and, and it helped him tremendously. It was, and it makes me question or wonder, how did we get, do we perhaps need more of that in terms of instead of men and women getting the same sermon, the same church experience, <clears throat> would it be easier? Because in, in, I, I know in some churches, don't men sit on one side and women sit on the other side of the church? And, uh, I, that, uh, that in the ancient world, that was true. I'm not sure of any place where that happens now. What, did the ancient world have it right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, let, let me address your underlying question, and that is, uh, well, it, it, there's an assumption behind it. It takes a man to disciple a man yes. in manhood. Yes. Okay? My, my assumption, I want you to answer my specific, because that's not a bad read of what I was saying, but it's not really. I'm saying, can a minister properly, boldly, masculinely preach the same way in a uh, man-woman environment or would he be more liberated if he were, there was a sermon for men and there was a sermon for women? There's advantages in what you're talking about. So I don't think it's either or. I think there's advantages with it. Let me make uh, a point that I'd like to make. Go ahead. I think that it I know you were going to do that. I, I, I think, it, we call you I think it takes men woman. to disciple men. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And, and the, God's plan A is that we would be disciples who disciple others. So it takes relationships. It takes eyeball to eyeball conversations with scripture. So it's men discipling men in the church is probably the most important thing that a church can do today is to get men being discipled by men, training men on what a godly man is, how a godly man is different than a woman, and calling men to live to that standard. That's the kind of thing that will make a big difference. Got you. And you and Anthony and Renew seem to be in alignment on that in terms of what, what you're saying is the discipling is yes. the most it's important the Bible. thing. It's the Bible. But, yeah. but, but okay, yeah. but, and so what you're basically saying, the Sunday sermon is different than discipling, correct? Is what has what uh, happened, and, and I think it's not to the advantage of the church, the church has become Sunday centric to where the impact and everything that happens a lot of time now is on Sunday. But the biblical model, even from the church's inception, the most effective ministry takes place outside of Sunday. 
So that's that's where when the church began the week of their beginning, they're meeting house to house daily. The discipleship is taking place. Even when Paul encourages his mentees, he's like Titus, Timothy, y'all teach the older men to teach the younger men, teach the older women to teach the. So the discipling portion, that's the daily journey. Sunday gathering. It's awesome. It's great. Yeah. But if you set up an entire ministry to where Sunday is your one time to hit a home run, your church is going to be lacking. It won't work. Got you. Yeah. But, but so he, here's what I want to say, and I've been talking about this, I think, since late last week, whatever. But I was watching uh, a Ben Franklin documentary, and, and it was talking about how in that time, what you did for entertainment, what you did for entertainment mm -hmm. was read the Bible. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to impress a woman, what you did was quote the Bible. That was a way of showing off their intelligence. Mm. They didn't have laptops, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have TVs, yeah. they didn't have radios. Entertainment mm. was reading the Bible. Yeah. If you wanted to impress people, quoting the Bible was the way that you did it. And I, so I think so again, they're really immersed in the culture. And so when you start talking about going to church on Monday would be considered entertainment. Going to church on Tuesday yeah. would be considered entertainment. That's how, how you socialize everything. We now have all this buffet of options that we think are better entertainment <laughs> than the Bible. And so w what I'm saying is that technology has so changed yeah. things that when we think about the olden times and how what the church was supposed to be and, and the way that it operated, the way Anthony just explained, some of that is because this was your source of entertainment. Sure. I think that, I think that people weren't as busy back then. But can, yes. can I make a point about this? Yeah. Church is not an event. I've, you and I have talked about this several times. Church is not an event where you listen to a preacher on Sunday. That's not a biblical church. Church is a community that you're a part of. So let me just paint the picture of how you would take the principles when you look at the life of Jesus and how he discipled people, how the early church discipled people in the temple courts and from house to house. Sometimes we describe it as a, it's like a, the two wings of an airplane. You've got your Sunday gathering and then you've got your discipling in groups and relationships throughout the week. Here's the ideal way that it'll work in North American culture right now. You have a Sunday gathering where it's biblical teaching. You come together, but you're in relationships then. Monday through Saturday, uh, in, in the case we're talking about, men need to be in relationship with other men. They're texting, they're talking, they're in discipling groups. You're listening to podcasts about what the Bible says. You're watching Fearless, and you're just engaged where you're at in this life where you see yourself is I'm here to be a disciple and I'm helping make disciples and that's the mission of our church. That's the mission of our community. Come and join us. Jesus is coming back. Totally. Obviously that's the ideal scenario and it's again, you just put the purpose of this show is like, oh, if you're a Christian, Come watch this show. We're going to talk about a Christian worldview. You can entertain yourself <laughs> Monday through Friday while still getting a biblical perspective and a point of view. You're immersing yourself in that culture. You're making a church experience every day of the week. Again, we're one show trying to, there's others out there. I don't want to say yeah. we're the only ones. Yeah. There, there's ways to do it. But, but I'm saying for most people, mm -hmm. They're at home watching Scarface or The Godfather or Desperate Housewives on Thursday. And, 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 so, and they do come together on Sunday, but they don't have all the other pieces, the Monday through Saturday because elements. Because it's not a community. Uh, it's yeah. not a com And so in that scenario, the scenario we have right now, mm -hmm. in order to perhaps get people to understand the foundation we need to go back to. Do we perhaps need to separate the two genders <laughs> so that ministers feel, because I think too much of the conversation, because when a woman enters the room, male conversation tends to change. Sure. And I'm just, it, it just does. Yeah. And, and that's fine if 
Monday through Saturday, you got all the stuff you're talking about going on. And so now on Sunday, you give a much yeah, broader that's, that's what we deal do. that ties all the pieces together. I, I get it, but we're not, right now, I'm just saying, there's not a fundamental understanding. And that's why I think it's just not connecting. So I think that what you're talking about is true of most churches. Yeah. It's not true in the churches we're talking about. Yeah. So in, in our church, our guys are broke. We call them transformation groups. And most of our men are in these transformation groups, meeting during the week, talking during the week, hanging out during the week, where it's men pouring into men what it means to follow Jesus and be like Jesus. We're coming together with our wives and children on the weekends, but we're a community. We're doing life together, and we're following Jesus together in community. We've got, we've got those kind of events like the retreat we just did. We've got events like that at least once a quarter. Um, I could share with you some that are meeting every Monday. Uh, that, that is just a man situation. I'm a part of about three or four different groups of guys that we text each other every single day. And, and I know where you're kind of going with it, Jason, as far as just getting the guys. And, and that I do believe in that space. I utilize that space. Some, some quarters I will spend my entire Wednesday night series, we'll separate. And we'll have every Wednesday night, just the guys section. We'll do that you know, a couple of times a, a year. But the idea that Bobby's you know, kind of getting across is this is a journey. This is like, if, if I had a one hitter quitter, I see exactly where you're coming yeah. from. But when you really get people into a journey where it is not a setting of 30 minutes or not, it may be that 15 minute, hey, we're just kind of chatting. I, you know, there are times throughout the year, especially during the school year, where I'm in with guys every morning, just before they go to work. 15 minutes before you go to work, hey, we're chatting it up, we're chopping it up, we're getting our mind ready for spiritual battle all day. We're going into work, handling the day, we check in at night, and that kind of dynamic helps to fortify, but there are definitely times. Jason, you, you're gonna be coming to some of these, but there are definitely times where we pull aside the men, hey guys, and we have a biblical discussion dealing with you know, real men issues, like how are you processing what you're going through? How are you handling this as a father? How are you handling this as a husband? How are you handling, you know, going to work? How are you dealing with that? We dig into the word and, and deal with that. I, I, TJ, I'm going to let you back in because we're running out of time. But uh, T, go, go, TJ, I know there's got to be something you want to react to here. Well, to your point about separating men and women, I, I just think where the strong men go, everyone follows. And so a more masculine message is appealing to everyone. And I think the church as a whole over a number of years, the message has, has probably changed. Um, it's become the, the way people view Christians today as, oh, they're empathetic. They're very nice. That's who I can go tell my problems to. And the, the godly men in the Bible are King David. It says Saul killed his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. They were the strong leaders who took charge and did things, and that is appealing. So I think you can give a masculine, strong message from the pulpit exactly the way that you should, like biblical men should be, and challenging people and giving them things to do and saying, we are all called to be leaders in this community, people of integrity, people who are supposed to... Uh, be living with the, the commandments that God has given us, be living out all of the biblical principles with pride, because those aren't your principles, those are God's principles. And so it's not about the world. I think when you challenge people and you call them to be everything God has called them to be, that's an attractive message. And, and truly, that's a masculine message. And it feels like the church as a whole has gone away from that. And so I, I think you could actually preach a more masculine message that would again, reach both men and women, because I think where the strong men go, the whole world follows. And I may be talking about an issue and I am that's most acute uh, in the black church, uh, but I do think it applies everywhere. The white churches. Follow. Yeah, got, got you. But I, let me finish my point in terms of, I deal with so many 
I don't want to call them friends because who knows who's watching. I just deal with so many guys in marriages that cannot and will admit they can't out talk, they can't out talk their wife. Yeah. The, 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 and if you go look at the academic disparity, black boys, black girls, or whatever, and all the energy has been poured into uh, black women, so they're more educated and they can out talk these dudes. And, and again, it's like they're not getting enough backup from the church because, you know, just, I keep telling y'all, the Bible adds about 50 IQ points uh, mm -hmm. to every person <laughs> that ingests it. And, and, and it's like I'm looking at guys that need an injection of that Bible IQ so they can even deal with yeah. what they got going on at home mm -hmm. with their wife. And so that, that's where I'm just trying to like, can we get some sermons? And these dudes need it almost daily, mm -hmm. you know, and they certainly need it on Sunday because I'm just their wife can out talk them. She's, she's got a higher GPA and right now she's making more money than them. And, and, and the whole world from Oprah on down is telling them, you're, they got a movie coming out. That was, I watched the movie, Nope, they got a movie coming out. The Woman is King, and it's yeah. about black women and how they slayed all these white men. They're pumping, they, they pumping steroids and mm -hmm. all this BS into mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and, you're making a very good point. It, and my point was that the, it's not just the black church. I think it's from what you've shared with me and Anthony, it's yeah. uh, more predominant there, but let me just tell you, the men are caving in white churches all over the country. I don't have any doubt about it. He won't, and, he won't, that man though, will not get what you're saying in a 30 to 45 minute sermon. That's right. If, if he is oh, he needs a seven listening, day a week. To, listening to rap all week and drinking and no all question. the games and stuff. He needs discipling like, relationships. <laughs> he needs the word. I'll just say yeah. this, I, cause I don't want to, the guys I'm talking about, yeah. They're not listening to rap. They're gotcha. not smoking weed. Gotcha. They're not drunk. They wrestling with some good, highly educated, okay, who've been convinced that they are kings. When and okay. and it's a battle, <laughs> and some gotcha. of them are losing the battle, uh, and and they need help. And that that's where I, I get the EW. If they and again, I'm sending everybody this EW Jackson deal. He'll get you fired up and get your man. But, but it's almost like what I'm seeing is uh, we got to go all the way back to the fundamentals. I've said this before about, I've told this story before. I think I told it on the show that when Vince Lombardi took over the Green Bay Packers, have I told this story before? First, when he took over the Green Bay Packers, his first meeting, he held up a Bible and a football. I <laughs> said, guys, no, I'm sorry. He held up a football and said, guys, this is a football. I mean, he started at the very beginning. And so where we have to go, we've been yeah. so torn down the map. We've got to hold up a Bible and say, hey, guys, this yeah. is the Bible. This, this is our page yes. one. But we, and we have to start at the very beginning. We've yeah. been obliterated. Sure. That, and that's why I'm like, it may take some one-on-one -on -one time to get us back up on our feet to get back in this wrestling match because this whole emasculated, female-driven, matriarchal culture is killing us. Yeah, let's do it. You're, you're calling it out. Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's go for that. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me take care of a little business. The Blaze Patriotic Sock Packs are back. At the end of last year, we released a limited supply of Let's Go Brandon socks so you could wear your patriotism wherever you want it. They were comfortable, stylish, and best of all, worth a laugh. Well, you spoke and we listened. So back by popular demand, we have new limited edition socks just in time for the primaries and back to school shopping. There are two sock packages and stylish drink covers to keep your beverage cool and patriotic. If you can't decide which sock package to choose from, remember this is America. You can always get both. And get this, if you buy both sock packages, We'll throw in a free bonus set of socks and an additional set of drink covers with a discount off the full purchase. Hurry though, these are limited edition. Get them now at blazesocks.com before they're gone. The materials, production, and the packaging of these socks are all 100% American from start to finish. Even 
the fine men and women packing and shipping these socks are Americans through and through. For our Blaze TV subscribers, we want to help you and thank you for your continued support. So we're sweetening the pot. Use promo code Blaze Sub for 20% off your purchase. That code is only available to Blaze TV subscribers. You must use the email address associated with your Blaze TV subscription to snag this discount. It's the same email address you use to log into Blaze TV. Not a subscriber? No problem. Subscribe to Blaze TV now and use the promo code Fearless socks to save on both your Blaze TV subscription and get 20% off these limited edition socks. Go to blazesocks.com to scope out the socks, get a pair for a uh, deserving dad, a grad, or that person who needs a new pair of socks and a laugh. Heck, maybe that person is you. Check it out. All right, Eric Schmidt, the Attorney General of Missouri. Eric. I just want, I want to be, I just want. All right, welcome back. All right, uh, let's do a little, dig a little deeper into the political realm. Eric Schmidt, the 43rd Attorney General of the state of Missouri, my former state, he's running for uh, the U.S. Senate. Uh, I think the GOP primary is about a, a week off. He's got a 12-point lead. Uh, he's got a good chance to win that uh, GOP nomination and a very good chance uh, to, be, to join our Senate. Eric Schmidt, uh, thank you uh, for joining us on Fearless. You, you caught my attention, Eric, because I, you're on to one of my pet issues. Social media, big tech, what, how they're manipulating the conversation, the public discourse, in America, I've been beating this drum for a good seven to ten years. That you know, Silicon Valley, Northern California, their social media apps are actually the enemy of free speech, of proper public discourse, and I'm so glad. And that's why I, I want to support you and your candidacy. I'm so glad you're willing to take on the collusion and uh, the manipulation and the abuse we see in social media. Yeah, thanks for having me on, by the way. And if you hear, if you hear some noise, we're in between campaign stops in the Lake of the Ozarks in Jeff City in Columbia. So you know the, you know the state a little bit. So, uh, but uh, we've been busy. But yeah, I mean, look, as Attorney General, you know, this is a core issue for me, which is we've known for a long time that big tech is trying to censor conservatives or certain kind of speech or speech that they deem uh, not worthy of, of the full amplification that it deserves or would normally get. Big tech's been doing that. But we filed a lawsuit uh, a couple of months ago that takes a little bit of a different angle at this, which is big government coordinating with big tech to silence stories. And so one of the things you always hear is, well, big tech's a private company. They're, you know, it, by the way, that doesn't make them immune from our laws. But the government certainly can't censor speech. That, you know, it's, that's a violation of somebody's First Amendment rights. The government is censoring speech. What's happening right now is that big government is colluding with big tech um, and outsourcing their censorship. And that's the nature of this lawsuit, which is, and we had a big order from a judge last week saying, yeah, you can issue discovery to Jen Psaki. You can issue discovery to Joe Biden, to Anthony Fauci, because we really want to see now where the first, for the first time, we're going to get a look under the hood to see what exactly is Anthony Fauci flagging for Facebook and for Twitter? What is the, the Biden administration flagging for these social media companies to silence conservatives? They've said it on air. I mean, they've admitted to it. They say, oh, we're working with Facebook partners for misinformation. And you know as well as I do, that is a really slippery slope. Um, this idea that we had a disinformation governance board in the United States of America, a ministry of truth, is Orwellian. It's crazy. And uh, you've been banging on this drum for a while, and I think we're going to get some answers here and uh, and really expose what's been going on and, and put a stop to it. Eric, I think this issue doesn't get addressed aggressively enough because I do think politicians know exactly what's going on, but so many of these politicians are dependent on the money that comes out of their relationships with Google, Facebook, Twitter, all the, the Silicon Valley 
big tech social media companies. And, and so why should Missourians, people in the United States, be confident that if we send you to the Senate, those, that money won't start flowing your way and you'll slow it down and shut, shut down your criticism of big tech? Well, look, I'm not running for the Senate to be the most popular person in D.C. or to get invited to all the cocktail parties. I want to go and be a disruptor. And I think what you see happening in this country, people are losing faith in these important institutions because they have violated the people's trust. And so, for example, I was the first AG in the country to sue communist China for releasing the coronavirus on the world. I was the first AG in the country to sue OSHA for the vaccine mandate that, you know, an, an agency created to make sure forklifts beep when they back up was proposing to force a medical procedure on 80 million Americans. So we brought that lawsuit with one. So my record, big tech at the border, we're, we're suing the Biden administration for violating the law and having an open borders and amnesty policy. So I've been unafraid to take on these big fights. And by the way, one of the things we're also been very vigilant, I've sued, sued 47 school districts in Missouri for the forced masking of our kids. It defies science. We're going after you know school districts for pushing critical race theory. Uh, forcing kids to do things like the privilege walk. I mean, this stuff is crazy, but you gotta have the backbone, you gotta stand up and you gotta fight. That's been my record as attorney general and that's the kind of fighting spirit I'm gonna take to the United States Senate. The other thing that I think is more difficult for guys like yourself, guys like Josh Hawley, uh, guys that are willing to push this fight is, is that people don't fully understand like, take, the Kansas City Star, the former newspaper I worked at. And just news, I don't want to pick on the Kansas City Star, but newspapers are dependent on these big tech companies because they're all obsessed with going viral and making sure they're popular over social media. A lot of their uh, economics is driven by what happens on these Facebook and platforms. And so the newspapers are reluctant to cover the issues that you're raising up and fully explain to the public why it's important. And, and that's what has frustrated me because it's, it's as a, someone that's worked in the media as long as I have, it was so crystal clear and obvious to me that there was a finger on the scales tipping things away from people with a biblical worldview, a conservative worldview, uh, yeah. th th it was so obvious to me, but the media won't cover it. H how do we make sure that we're able to educate the public on just how bad this system and who's all involved and in benefiting from this corrupt system? Well, look, you know, print media is dying. Um, and so what these newspapers like the Kansas City Star and the Post-Dispatch, uh, what they've decided to do is to appeal to you know, sort of the left and will culture and, they, de and, and they, de they depend on clicks essentially, right? And so you're right, they're sort of in bed with these big tech companies. The best solution here is, what's really interesting about this broader debate, and you think of it more philosophically is, you know, with the advent of the internet, it started out in the 1960s, right? Think of this centralization, the IBM big supercomputer, right? And then I'm 47, so I'm Gen X. When I was in college, you know, in the 90s, you had this democratization of information, right? The Internet meant anybody could go. It'd be like this big library. And there's a lot of hope and optimism uh, around it. And in fact, Congress protected these big tech companies as platforms under Section 230, what it's called, that basically you can't sue the platform because they're not a publisher, right? You can sue somebody for, you know, the, the New York Times or Time magazine if they, you know, if they commit libel because they're a publisher, they're making publishing decisions. Big tech got this protection in the nineties as just a publisher. But now what you see happening is they get the best of both worlds, right? They have all this immunity and all this protection under section 230, but they're also acting like a publisher because they're deciding what they want to put on, who they're going to censor. And guess what? It has a very left leaning worldview. One of the things that we hope to get out of this lawsuit is that, to really expose for the first time, because most of these cases, they got moved to the Northern District of California against, you know, these big tech giants, and they just, they went away. We're in Louisiana, Missouri partners with Louisiana. We've got a judge that's allowed us now to get the discovery. So this is a different ball game. And we're gonna see these documents now that we've been asking for. And I think people, you know, you had the Biden administration weaponizing the FBI to go after parents for, uh, you know, showing up to school board meetings, 
this is an administration that is hell bent on power and control. That's what that's what all this COVID tyranny was all about. And you see it with with big tech. They want to control the narrative. They call everything they don't like misinformation. And you try to, you know, just sort of uh, let everybody know that this person's not worthy to be listened to. And we got to put a stop to that in this country. It was founded on the idea. What our founders said 240 plus years ago is everybody had backwards. Our rights don't come from a king or a queen. They come from God. And that government is just our shared project to protect those God-given rights, like the ability to speak your mind, the ability to peacefully assemble, the ability to protect yourself. So when government starts infringing upon those rights, it's up to us to push back, and that's what we're doing. I want to get your opinion on this. This is in the news cycle. Elon Musk flirtation with Twitter that seems to be coming to an end, but it may uh work out well for us in terms of we may discover some information about twitter and how many bots there are and things like that yeah. do, do you think elon musk was a potential solution and improvement to what we were going to see in social media uh is it a disappointment if he doesn't end up buying twitter yeah i think look i think people are we're, we're starving for this real platform right where Everybody can have their their say and trust me. I'm on Twitter and there are some people who say some really terrible things about me Whatever this is, you know, this is America people can say their piece I think what people get frustrated is that bandwidth seems to narrow of what's acceptable speech when the left has You know, or they're in charge and they're certainly in charge of platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram These big big companies that ought to be broken up by the way um, And we've got a lawsuit for that as well to try to provide some competition because people say, well, build your own Twitter. Well, we see what happened, right? They basically, Amazon said, we're not gonna host your site. Um, you can't build another Google. They completely dominated. So we gotta bust up these big, big tech companies, encourage competition. But yeah, I think there's a real desire. And I don't understand, you know, the modern left here used to be liberals believed in this kind of thing, but you see it morphing into this more Marxist ideology where it's about controlling, it's about indoctrination, it's about rewarding and punishing, turn in somebody who says something wrong, shame them. I mean, this is dangerous stuff in the United States of America. It goes on all the time in China and other you know, socialist countries. It has since the beginning of time. But America is supposed to be that exception. That's what we mean by American exceptionalism. And we better fight for it because if once it's gone, it's gone. Eric, uh I'll tell you, over the weekend, I was talking to TJ Moe about having you on the show, and I expressed some concern to TJ because, you know, you're from St. Louis, and we know that people from Kansas City have a higher IQ, uh, <laughs> and TJ said, no, trust me, Eric will be fine, he'll be able to keep up with you, uh, but, you know, because I had the same concern about having TJ on the show, being from the St. Louis area, but Eric, I got yeah, you it. exceeded my expectations. Uh, but well, you are that. where well, Kansas like, City is. But hey, but it, but it sounds like the bar was pretty low, so I'll I'll take what I can get. <laughs> you are. Hey, by the way, like TJ, Kansas TJ, City TJ is. TJ was. Yeah, no, no. TJ was at something this weekend. He was introduced as uh, Mizzou legend TJ Mo, and he's right. Mizzou legend TJ Mo. He's a great guy. Well, he's a legend on the St. Louis side. On on the Kansas <laughs> City side, we t you know we t Tony Temple is our legend. Uh, Tony from, Temple sure. <laughs> from. Yeah, from that era, but you are aware, like, Kansas City has better food, better sports teams, better everything than St. Louis. You, you Man, I'm in the middle of a statewide that. race. You think I'm going to argue with you right now? I'm in the middle of a U.S. Senate <laughs> race, so you, you got free run on this. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Appreciate you. Good luck. All right, that's Eric Schmidt. I believe I hear tomorrow, and that means uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Freedom, look for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation. We all just wanna have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving. And all the season we all wanna be free We want free